Good morning. Let's open our Bibles this morning to Luke chapter 3, verse 16, as we continue our journey through Luke's gospel. We mentioned last Wednesday as we began the book of Genesis that God is only interested in the Bible in one person and two events. He wants you to meet his son, and he's interested in you learning about his first coming and then his second coming. And really everything points to that. So when we get to the gospel, certainly it is the introduction of our Lord's first coming. It had been 400 years since God had spoken to the nation of Israel. It had been just silent. And then God had begun to work again. He had called John the Baptist through his father <clears throat> to prepare him to be the forerunner of Christ. And Luke, as, as a, a Gentile doctor who was commissioned in the second kind of uh, generation to go and interview folks and, and get a, a true line upon what has been going on, Luke's gospel is really the, the gospel of eyewitnesses. Luke wasn't there. He interviewed folks who were. And he, being very diligent as a doctor, that kind of mind, you know, is, is very clear. It just kind of puts one thing upon another. Tells us about John's announcements of his birth, or his birth, and then the birth of Jesus and all. And uh, we, we come in chapter 3 to the ministry of John, and then real quickly to the public presentation of Jesus. So after 400 years, here comes, you know, God's promised Messiah, one that had been spoken about for thousands of years. I have no idea. I, we didn't plan that. That's all brand new. That's exciting. We looked last week or the, t the week before uh, at John's message, and we began in verse 1, and we went down through verse, that was cute, actually, verse 15. <laughs> and we saw John had one message, and his message was pretty clear, and it was a message to the Jews, which is interesting, because the Jews consider some, themselves God's people, and so we don't need to be baptized. Gentiles were baptized when they converted to Judaism, when they changed their mind about a multiplicity of gods, and they believed in one God, which is what the Jews did. But John came first to the to the Jews themselves and, and called them to repentance. He, he spoke to them as one crying out in the wilderness. He was a fulfillment of God's plan to prepare the way, if you will. And, and John was very straightforward. He, he wanted them to bring forth fruits that would say they were repentant, repentance, turn around of their, of their ways and turn to the Lord, and then live accordingly. John's baptism was just of that, that a willingness to admit your sin and so when Jesus comes, you can then say, he's my savior. I need a savior. And John would prepare the way. In fact, there was a great conviction as John spoke. He, he talked about laying the ax to the root of the tree. And, and the people said in verse, verse 10, well, what are we supposed to do? And John began to give them examples of how godliness could be out in their lives. And, and to be honest, it was things that he asked of them that they couldn't do. But they could then see their weakness and their need for help. As he shared, verse 15, where he ended there last time, the people, because they were expectant for a Savior to come, began to talk to each other about maybe this is him. Maybe this John is the Messiah that was to be promised, the, the Christ. And so this morning, we're going to pick up in verse 16 and, and head to the end of the chapter, which will be easy for us since beginning in verse 23, we have a lot of names. And we'll try to understand what that means. You know, the one thing any preacher longs for is the anointing of God's Spirit. I, I think that uh, anyone who has ever taught the Bible knows the difference between teaching, having it all right, and yet not being anointed by God's Spirit. And maybe you do in your own life as well. You just, just know when God is moving upon your heart. Well, John the Baptist was a man who had been filled by the Holy Spirit from his womb, from the womb. He had for 30 years been groomed in silence by the Lord. He had recently launched into his ministry. It would bear tremendous amounts of fruit early on. Many of the normal folks, and not so much the religious folks, but the normal folk came and they, 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 they listened. What do we do? Where do we turn? Who is it that we should follow? 
And God began to do into John, in John's life what he would like to do in ours. And John, in response to the people, are you the one? You know, said, no, 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 I'm nowhere near the one. In fact, you not, cannot even compare me to the one. Years from now, Jesus will say to the disciples there in John 16 about, his, about the ministry of the Holy Spirit, that when the Holy Spirit comes, that he will guide you into all truth. And that he will speak not of his own, but words that his authority, he'll speak what he has heard. And then he said, he will glorify me, and he'll take what is mine, and he will declare it to you. And certainly that was what God was doing in John's life here as Jesus now is about to come upon the scene. He's pointing to the one who needs to be known. So should we. So should we. John was causing quite a stir as the Holy Spirit began to, to move upon his life. And the people's expectations, verse 15, were, were heightened. Success in ministry can stumble a lot of folks. It is something to be seen. We've seen it over the years with folks who who start off humbly enough and then find some measure of blessing in God's hand and, and all of a sudden they begin to take credit or think that they are something they are not. I would tell you as, as a pastor that you're only as good as your last sermon. If God is done with you, he's done with you. So to take credit for his work is foolishness, but there's always that temptation. John had, had moved a nation in many ways and yet he wasn't moved himself. He trusted the Lord. He was interested in what God was going to do. He was willing to point to a Savior and to point away from himself. So, are you him? Verse 16, John answered and said to them, I indeed will baptize you with water. But one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal straps I am not worthy to loose, and he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit, and he will baptize you with fire. The word answered there in, in, in Greek is, is expressly answered. It, it, no doubt, no hesitation. John wanted them to know in no uncertain terms that he wasn't the one. I can't so much as take the lowliest position of a servant to untie his shoes when he comes into the house. A true servant knows their place before the Lord. And though John had had tremendous success from all that we can gather from the, from the Gospels, he was also aware of his frailty and, and of God's glory. So though the people rushed to John, are you the one? And he might very well have gone, well, I'm, I know him, you know. It, it didn't even occur to him. There's that scripture in Proverbs chapter 25 that said, it's not good to eat too much honey, neither is it good to seek your own glory, because that will not be glory. Remember James and John early on there. Uh, well, Jesus thought that they, you know, were on the in crowd, and they, they said to the Lord there in, in Mark 8, could you just let us sit one on your right hand, the other on your left when you come to glory? We just, we just like to be, you know, vice presidents of the world. And, and the Lord kind of had to put them in their place. God resists the proud, gives grace to the humble. But the way to keep from taking the privileges of grace for granted is never forgetting whose shoes you're unworthy to loose. We were in Hawaii this last week, and there's a, a Hawaiian word that people use for mainlanders. They call them haoles. But the word haole in, in Hawaiian literally means to neglect to be reverent. And I thought, you know, that's so often is the way we seem to come to the Lord. You know, and we should never come to the Lord that way. <laughs> draw men to Jesus. Don't draw men to you. Well, that was John's ministry for sure. And we'll be great in God's sight if we're small in our own. And so John begins to minister on the people where they flock to him. Oh, my goodness. You the one? No. I am not the one. In fact, I can't even picture myself being worthy to untie his shoes. The superiority of Jesus' person is also matched by the superiority of Jesus' ministry. Notice that John goes on in verse 17 and says of him, he, his winning, winning, winnowing, sorry, fan, is in his hand, and he will thoroughly cleanse out his threshing floor and gather the wheat into the barns, but the chaff he will burn with an unquenchable fire. You know, you can be baptized externally and never have your heart changed. 
You can go through the motions. We're going to have baptism next Sunday afternoon. I hope you'll all come. It's, a, it's a, one of those sacraments in the church, that and communion. It's important to the Lord. But in, indeed, you can go through the motions and have it mean nothing. But when the Lord is able to touch your life, then God meets you at that place of repentance and his work, his spirit, begins to cleanse you and to purify you. Man can repent, but that's as far as man can go. You can repent. God has to change. You can turn away from how you once were. But God is going to have to do that which you can't do, give you a new heart, give you new desires, give you an empowerment within to, to will to do of his good pleasure. Jesus' ministry was so far superior to John's because John could warn you and tell you about your sin and your need, but Jesus could meet your need. That's the difference. With the coming of the Holy Spirit, there comes fire. I think in, in Malachi chapter 3, we read, Behold, I send my messenger. He will prepare the way before me. The Lord whom you seek will come suddenly to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he's coming, saith the Lord. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand before him when he appears? He'll be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. It, it, the first verse speaks of John, but the second speaks of Jesus. He's coming to clean. He's coming to wash. He's coming to make new. And Jesus' judgment here in verse 17 is totally discriminating. You know, John didn't know as he was baptizing folks who they were, what their intentions or their motives were. In fact, if you were with us a couple weeks ago in verse 7, John, seeing the Pharisees came, and he called them a brood of vipers. That's not exactly a kind word. You bunch of snakes, what are you doing here? But John was trying to cover every, I think, you know, base in the hopes of smoking out the hypocrites. But Jesus knows the heart. Peter would learn that when he met with Jesus there after the resurrection in John 21, where the Lord said to Peter, do you really love me? <laughs> Three different times he talked to him about his relationship with him. And he finally just said, Lord, I, you know who, what I'm all about. You know who I am. God's judgments are perfect. Jesus comes to judge. You know, a threshing floor was was a place that the, a farmer would go to the top of a hill and find a, a hard rock and begin to just beat the, the, she, the, the sheaves of the beet in, in, into the rock, and it would just kind of, it, it would release the chaff, which is very light and around the edges, and then it would, the, the wheat would stay put on the rocks or fall to the ground because they were far heavier. And so they would throw this, this mixture up and the wind would carry away the chaff. God uses that often to speak of how he's able to separate the believer from the unbeliever, the, the one who is, you know, headed for judgment and those who have been delivered from it. In fact, if you look, look at the word here, uh, unquenchable fire, the word for unquenchable is the Hebrew word, sorry, the Greek word for asbestos, which is interesting. And then the fire is unquenchable. It, it, it just, it'll continue to burn. But so will your salvation. So Jesus is coming, John says. And he'll have a, a fan in his hand, and he'll be able to separate the believer from the unbeliever, from the true believer, from the, from the poser. He knows the judgment, and the judgment will be eternal. We read in verse 18 that with such words and many others, John exhorted as he preached to the people. But Herod the Tetrarch, being rebuked by him concerning Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, and for all the evils which Herod had done, also added this above all, that he shut John up in prison. Verse 18 tells us that the, that the anointed preaching of this, this forerunner John was an exhortation. The word in, in Greek for exhortation is where we get our English word eulogy from, or evangelism. But it literally speaks to, it means to speak well of someone declaring, in this case, the good news of, of the Lord's coming. But even the message of judgment is a great comfort to people because you really don't know how valuable grace is until you realize what you have as an alternative. So often it is the gospel that is received because the law has been understood. The judgment of it. Paul certainly follows that, that formula in the book of Romans. He, he lays out how bad things are for us and then talks about God's grace. But by the time you get to chapter 
you know, the, the middle of chapter 3 and all the way to chapter uh, 8, you, you're saying, oh man, I need this grace of God because I realize who I am and, and what, what my fate is before the Lord. And so John encouraged the people with pretty tough words. But at the same time, he became, you know, a, a help and a blessing to them because he turned their eyes to the things that they were facing without a relationship with God. The, the, the one thing about evangelism, it doesn't leave you neutral. You have to make up your mind which, sty, you know, which side of the fence you're going to stand on. If, if the Bible says Jesus is the only way and without him you'll never make it, there, you can't take that or leave that. You either believe it and you jump in with both feet or you run away from it as heresy that you are not going to embrace and you're going to take your chances on your own. But it, the, the gospel can't leave you, you know, kind of suspended in the middle somewhere. It, it just won't allow for it to be that way. Um, as Luke looks ahead, and, and, and he looks ahead uh, from, from a, a standpoint of, of timing, he looks ahead to John the Baptist's eventual arrest and, and then execution for his preaching. He mentions the issue of Herod and Herodias. Herodias, uh, his brother Philip's wife, who he had an affair with, it caused her to leave uh, her husband Philip and, and marry Herod instead. instead the, the story is found in Mark chapter 6, but John was not willing to compromise the message just for the hearer, and I think that's important. Now this doesn't happen immediately, chronologically. This t happens a year plus down the road, if you will, from where we're reading. Uh, as you get that chronology from Mark. But, but John could not, would not um, compromise his message. Could he have lived longer had he toned it down a little bit? I think he probably could have. Is there an easier way to minister to people and still be liked? Sure. But the message isn't a likable one initially because no one likes to think about themselves as, as sinners. Who do you think you are? <laughs> well, I'm just like you. Well, you don't know who I am. I know who I am, and you're just like me. It's hard to pre preach a message, but is it more effective to water it down? It is not. If you go read Mark chapter 6, you read that when John was finally arrested, one of the things that came up, and the reason he was arrested, was his comments about uh, Herod's, you know, <laughs> political, romantic life. It was very public knowledge. But if you go and read when, when John was put in prison, it says that he and Herod had long talks together about a lot of things and that for a while Herod listened to him gladly. So John was a good witness to the guy. Did it get him killed? It did. It did. But faithfully he continued to bear witness to Jesus and that's exactly where he started. I think when Paul wrote to the uh, Corinthians in chapter 2 of, of 2 Corinthians, he said, to some people, we are the aroma of death that leads to death, while to others, we are the aroma of life. Who's so, who can be sufficient for this? But that's really what you have, even as you go out of here this morning. You have a gospel that can lead people to eternal life or have them to realize they are headed in, 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 into a place of eternal judgment. Who's sufficient? Well, we're not, but God is, as you allow him to be you know, the, the Lord of your life. But evangelism does that. And, and notice that John, he, be, he was preaching, he was, he was warning, he was inviting people to, to, to admit that they were sinners. That's John's message. You're a sinner. Now there's one coming after me who can fix that. But you're the sinner. You're the one who needs this help. And, and we will read in, in Luke later on that, that the, the Pharisees will say, well, we don't agree, so we're not getting baptized. And that was their own choice. But they would answer for that choice. So don't be ashamed of the gospel. Tell people. I know it's hard to hear you're a sinner, but you're a sinner. What's worst is no, nobody telling you, and then you die, and now you're judged. Warn them. Love them. John was faithful. Even though, as Luke said, it cost him his life. But he pulls this out of, the, out of the, the chronology just to say this is how it ended up for John. Well, back to the present tense, verse 21. When all of the people were baptized, 
it came to pass that Jesus also came to be baptized. And while he was praying, the heavens were opened. The description of Jesus' baptism by Luke is pretty sketchy. By that I mean he doesn't exactly tell us where. doesn't exactly tell us how many people were there, what day of the week it happened, what, what month it took place, why Jesus would come to be baptized at all. Matthew helps us a little bit. Matthew records that Jesus came into the Galilee area to John to be baptized, so he was in the north. Um, not so much where John was baptizing, oftentimes in the south, but in the north. John tried to stop Jesus. He, he said as he was coming, and, and as we read from Luke, it seemed to be at the end of the day when everyone had been baptized. It was, it was the end of things. He was the, the last one in, if you will. That, that John said, look, I need to be baptized by you. I need to be confessing my sins instead of you coming to me. I need to repent. And Jesus said, just allow it to be so for now, for in so doing it is fit that you fulfill all righteousness. And thus he allowed him to be baptized. We know from John chapter 1 that John the Baptist himself only learned of Jesus and who he was by a word that he had received from the Father. In John chapter 1 verse 33, John had written this, I did not know him or John the Baptist. But he who sent me to baptize with water said, upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, he's the one that will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And then John writes, I have seen and I testify now that this is the Son of God. John's hesitancy in baptizing Jesus in Matthew was not because he, was, he knew he was the Messiah, because he didn't know yet. He hadn't seen the, the Spirit fall like a dove from heaven upon him. But he had had a relationship with Jesus for 30 years. They were cousins. He had seen that Jesus far outdid him in terms of right and wrong. He had that picture of him and said to him, I should be getting baptized by you. But it wasn't until the baptism that he realized who he was dealing with and that the Lord had caused him to know now the Messiah himself. Because the Lord needs to reveal to us who the Lord is. We can all see Jesus as good. A lot of people say, oh, he's just a good man. He always does sing good. He just seems like he always says the right things. No, no, he's the Messiah. Different. But that requires spiritual insight. Jesus was completely righteous. Jesus was sinless. But John didn't realize, John the Baptist, until the baptism had taken place and the Holy Spirit fell from heaven upon the Son of God as Jesus was praying. He came to identify with us at the point where we identify with our sinfulness. Jesus, do it, do it now because I've come to identify with sinful men. Did he need to be baptized? No. But he did so to identify with all of us because if you're going to be saved, you're going to have to repent. And you're going to have to meet Jesus at a place where you realize you don't have anything to offer him, but you've got a lot that you need from him. And so it is. That's how baptism works. That's what baptism was all about. That's how salvation works. He didn't come to confess his sins, but he came to be our Savior for those who would confess their sins to him. He made him to be sin who knew no sin so that we could be the righteousness of God in him. We could be saved in him. The voice of approval for his willingness and his love is heard here. This is my beloved son. With you I'm well, well pleased. Jesus is coming to be baptized is really a promise, if you will, early on that he was going to go pay the price. I'm here to meet man in his sin and deliver him from it, to save him. His public acceptance of that saving work. We will read um, when Jesus is in the garden uh, three years down the road, Matthew, uh, John chapter 12, that Jesus will be in agony 
And he'll say to the Lord, Father, save me from this hour. And yet then you read, but for this hour I have come. This is the purpose for my coming. This is why I am here. And, and again, he will say in the garden, Father, glorify yourself. And the Father's voice will say, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it yet again. N notice that at the baptism, it was Jesus who was praying. Praying as he came out of the water. Luke, as he focuses on the humanity of Jesus constantly, it goes out of his way to point out Jesus' habits of prayer. As his ministry began to grow, chapter 5, Jesus more and more pulled away and began to pray more often, it seems, at least pointed out by Mark. When he had to choose the 12 apostles in Luke 6, he went away for a night to pray. When the, uh, he had to tell the apostles in Caesarea Philippi, this is our last year, we're headed for Jerusalem, I'm about to be arrested and murdered. He first went aside to pray. In chapter 11 of Luke, you will see the disciples coming to Jesus one time and just saying, hey, could you teach us to pray like you pray? The Lord was constantly praying. In fact, you know, he, he prays for Peter and his deny, he prays at the Garden of Transfigur or the Mount of Transfiguration. He prays for hours in the garden. I think there are seven specific times in the book of Luke where, where Jesus is pointed out by Luke and says, look at his prayer life as our example. There are lots of Greek words for prayer. This one is the general word for worship. Not for petition. Petition is what we're good at. Hi, Lord, I'm here again. I need a lot of stuff. Let me give you a list. That's prayer of petition. This is prayer of adoration and worship. Often our prayers are getting. God would like our prayers of blessing, too. I think sometimes we miss out on that. But baptism for us is to be a time of worship. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. Thank you, Lord, for for forgiving me my sins. Thank you, Lord, for pouring out your spirit upon my life. Well, three things happen here, verse 21 and 22, as a result of Jesus' baptism and, and this being his, his public, if you will, um, presentation to the world of who he is and why he's come. Number one, the heavens are opened. Supernatural kind of revelation for sure. Second of all, the Holy Spirit descends in a bodily form like a dove upon him. And, and John said that he saw it in John uh, chapter 1, verse 32. I, I saw it with my own eyes. By the way, a, a dove had never been used before this time as a symbol of the Holy Spirit in the Bible. Why a dove? Jesus would come with fire, <laughs> and yet his offer is reconciliation. His offer is, is peace. It's the gentleness of, of God's desire. He invites us to come. So the Holy Spirit comes as a duff to bring peace to man. And then there's this voice from heaven. Two physical manifestations and then a roar, if you will, from the clouds. There are three times that the Father um, speaks to his Son out loud. One is here. One is uh, on the Mount of Transfiguration. John chapter 12 is as Jesus heads for his sacrifice at Calvary. And, and then there is that one in the, um, as he approaches the garden as well. Uh, Jesus called his death, the cross, his baptism. Don't I have a baptism to be baptized with? So for us, baptism speaks of our death, the old life, the old ways. Remember, it is preceded by repentance, a turning away from our old life, and then a turning to the Lord. Help me. Send your spirit to, to, to burn within, to enable, to make new. The voice quotes here to Jesus two messianic verses. One of them in, out of uh, Psalm chapter 2, verse 7. We read that this morning. And the other one, uh, in, in you my soul delights out of Isaiah 42. One speaks of him being the king, right? We read that this morning. Isaiah 42 speaks about his suffering and his willingness to suffer on our behalf. What exactly pleased the Father? Well, in retrospect, 30 years of obscurity and preparation as Jesus of Nazareth. In prospect, looking ahead, his sacrifice was about 
to take place. The, the road was now marked, and he would walk it faithfully. Isaiah 53, I think it's verse 10, you read these for remarkable words. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. It pleased the Lord to bruise him, to put him to grief, to make his soul an offering for sin, so that his seed, if you see his days, the pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. It pleased the Father to send his son. It pleased the Father that his son came. And the result was failing and flawed children of sin of the first Adam would be redeemed by the blood and the triumph of the second one. I'm well pleased in you. It is why the Father is able to say to you, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, everything has become new. You become God's children. God takes you in. Quite a day, this baptism. We read in verse 23, And Jesus himself began his ministry. He was about 30 years old. And being as was supposed, the son of Joseph, the son of Heli, and I won't read any of these until you get to verse 38, which says, And the son of Anish, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, and the son of God. Jesus came to his public ministry about 30 years old. If you've read the Old Testament, Numbers chapter 4, you know that the priests began their ministry publicly at 30 years old. They, by the way, retired as 50. What are we doing wrong? But they were allowed to be apprentices from the age of 20 to the age of 30. Now, we're given by Luke here at the end of this awesome experience a genealogy of Jesus that might on the surface look a little bit confusing. I don't think that's Luke's intention. I think it is intention to make, because it's in the context of the Lord has come to save the lost, to identify with those that are repenting of their sins, to lay the ax to the root of the tree, to bring judgment, and yet the powering out of God's spirit as a dove who can bring peace. And so that's the context in which we find this presented to us here. Um, <clears throat> There are many Old Testament genealogies. There are 10 in the book of Genesis alone. So when we get to those, we'll, we'll do chapters <laughs> at a time. There are many in First Chronicles as well. God has a purpose for preserving these lists. Jacob uh, would say to his son Judah there in chapter tw uh, 20, uh, no, 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 49, at the end of chapter, no, in chapter 49 of Genesis, um, the scepter or the rulership or the ability to rule will not depart from Judah nor a lawgiver between his feet until, the, until Shiloh comes, until the Messiah comes. You'll have a chance to rule yourself. It is one of the things that caused such consternation for the Jews in Jesus' day because the Romans had taken all of their ability to rule themselves away. And so they thought, looking at that promise, God hasn't, hasn't come. <laughs> He's made a promise. He hasn't come, but he did come, and he was there, and he would reveal himself. So the genealogies were important for the times that the Lord used them, and you can find the Messiah uh, from Adam to Abraham to David to Jesus, all of those men being given promises, significant promises, about their descendancy that pointed to Jesus. <clears throat> the problem today for the Jews, by the way, is that there are no records available anymore for descendancy. There you just have to guess. Those records were destroyed. They were kept until Jesus came. And then with the attack upon Jerusalem, most of those records disappeared. They were burned. They were, they were taken. And their usefulness was gone. And the reason is we don't need any more priests. We don't need any more descendants. We have Jesus. He's come. So there's no sense keeping them. Here in Luke, the genealogy appears to be that of Joseph, if you read uh, beginning in verse 23. However, there are great differences between this one and the one that is Joseph's in Matthew chapter 1. For one thing, Luke goes in the reverse order. He goes back, he ends up, I read verse 38 on purpose, to go back to the Lord. There are no genealogies that end with God. It usually goes forward, this one goes backwards. The genealogies also, by comparison, are completely different between 
Joseph and David. Matthew lists Joseph's father's name as Jacob. Here it is listed as Heli. In Abraham to Joseph, no, Abraham to Jacob, uh, David, the genealogies are both the same, Matthew and, and Luke. This is no doubt Mary's genealogy. The one in Matthew is Joseph that goes through Solomon. It has uh, in that list a fellow named Jeconiah, Matthew chapter 1, verse 11 and 12, who was judged in the Old Testament by the Lord as never being allowed to sit on the throne. So Joseph was no way, though he was from that tribe, he was no way going to be able to have someone sit on the throne. It was a cursed line, if you will. And Joseph wasn't Jesus' father anyway, right? He was, but he was there. So uh, he could not have been uh, the father. Uh, Matthew gives, like I said, Joseph's ancestry by birth. But, but here's what happens if a Jewish woman married but had no brothers. Like Joseph, and marries Joseph her father would become uh, uh, able to legally adopt Joseph as a son and as an heir. And Mary's father was named Eli. So, whereas Matthew gives Joseph's ancestry according to birth, and it shows that he doesn't qualify to be the king, um, Luke gives his... Uh, Ancestry through Mary by adoption, if you will, and this is Mary's family tree. She's the mother, Joseph is not the father. And notice what we read here in verse 23, as was supposed that he was the father, he was not. I think the real emphasis, though, that is important is in verse 38. And I think that's why you find it here in this chapter. And that is the striking central reason is that, you know, life terminates with and your hopes terminate with the Lord. Like I said, there's no parallel in the Old Testament where a genealogy ends with the name of God. But I think that's Luke's point to begin with. Jesus, Jesus is none other than he's the son of God, but he's also the son of man. And we're all his offspring in the sense of physical life, but sin has alienated us from him. And so we need a savior. We need a savior. So Luke sets before us Jesus, the Son of God, the Son of Man, made flesh. But from now on in his public ministry, he will show us the heart of God as he fans the flames of repentance and warns of the flames of judgment. He'll be the reason. He'll be the linchpin. He'll be the door upon which swings everybody's life. He's come to save, to adopt, to bring you into his family of faith. It's his idea to your benefit but like those in the crowd with John on that first century meeting, you're going to have to decide, is he the Lord or not? But he's the one that John says, I can't even tie his shoes. But he's great, and he knows the hearts of man, and he will pour out his spirit, and he'll show you who he is and who you are and what you need. And so come and repent. And the people did, and many would not. Same is true today. Some will come, some will not. But the answer will still be the same. And our hope as well, Jesus Christ. Shall we pray? Lord, it is certainly important to you that we, in coming to Jesus' baptism, walk away with the right message. As we watch the anointing of your Holy Spirit be upon this forerunner, John, as we see him boldly proclaim the sinfulness of man in the face of the religious zealots and the naysayers and the opposition, you began to move in a glorious way and many turned to, to be baptized, to cry out for help. One's coming, but John didn't know who he was except he'd been told there would be one coming. And, and in his life, the Holy Spirit would come down from heaven bodily. He would see it, and he'd be the one. I know, Lord, it is for this reason that as we continue in the Gospels that John will now declare when he sees Jesus, behold, he's the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. I, I have to decrease. He has to increase. 
But Lord, we all stand with the crowds listening to John's message this morning. We have to repent. I would say to you this morning, there's nothing you can do except turn to Jesus to get into heaven. Can't clean up your act. Can't make promises that you won't be able to keep. Can't swear to do better. Take an oath. Cross your heart. Hope to die. You can't count to ten. Cross your fingers. Set your brow. Be determinative. Nothing will help you. Sin wins until the Messiah delivers. Which is why religion will fail you. Religion will tell you what you should do. Well, so will the law. But the law will admit that it can't help you to do it, and neither can religion. But Jesus can. And if you'll open up your heart to him and be born again of his spirit, he will send his spirit within your heart to enable. He will give you a new heart and a new outlook. And in, and in a willingness to begin to do what he wants. And it'll be his work in you. And that'll be your hope of glory. Christ in you. That's your hope. And if he's not in you this morning, would you come and pray with one of the pastors and, and invite him to come in and do that work and agree with those that stood with John in, in those days along the, the Jordan River and, and agree that repentance was necessary. I need to turn from my ways and turn to you. Help me, Lord. Thank you for coming. Because you came, I realize I need you. Because who would come as just a, uh, an alternative? <laughs> no, he's the only way. And if you'll believe in him this morning, you'll have eternal life. If you're watching online, you can follow the links in the descriptions below there. and We'll take you to a page to talk to you from the Bible about what it means and what it takes to be born again. Don't pass up the opportunity. Don't be like the Pharisees that stand back, fold your arms and say, I don't need him. Oh, but you do. And the sooner you realize that, the better. God can begin to redeem what the years have taken away. Give him your life this morning. Give it to him in Jesus' name. Hope you've been enjoying the studies as we've been putting them out here on our YouTube channel. Please subscribe. Um, hit the notification button if you'd like to be notified of our next release study. And also leave a comment. All of those things help the channel and it allows us to reach more people. So thanks for joining us. God bless you.